gospel reading for this morning comes from the third chapter of Luke's gospel. As Christmas and Epiphany began to recede behind us, each year we, we come to John, John the Baptist, one more time, as Jesus comes for his baptism, as we celebrate the baptism of the Lord. Let us remember our own baptisms and let us listen now for what the Spirit may speak to us through these words. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And we skip over a few verses where, interestingly, Luke goes ahead and has John arrested and in prison before Jesus is actually baptized. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Have you ever known someone who was going through a tough, a rough time, and in the middle of it disappeared from church? Sometimes a, an illness or a death of a loved one can cause people a faith crisis, and they will pull away, but I'm thinking about something different. I'm, I'm thinking more of when something happens and people worry that they might be judged and so disappear. It doesn't happen as much as it used to with divorce, but there are still people who are embarrassed enough when a divorce happens that they stay away from church. Uh, but graduate to things like getting arrested or some other form of public humiliation, and you will find it grows much more likely that people don't dare show their face around the church. After all, churches are for good, respectable people. I thought about respectable people as I read Luke's take on Jesus' baptism. All the gospel writers provide their own take uh, on this event. It was apparently well known enough that they all felt a need to address this potentially embarrassing episode. I mean, why did Jesus need a baptism of repentance and forgiveness after all? In Matthew's gospel, the, the question of why is spoken by John the Baptist directly. But Luke does something different. There's no conversation with John. Jesus does not speak at all. Luke simply throws Jesus in with the other folks coming out for baptism. And when all the people were baptized... And when Jesus also had been baptized. Apparently, without any fanfare at all, Jesus just gets in line with everybody else, with, with all that brood of vipers that came out to John in the wilderness. Jesus joins those who feel like they have to turn their life around, who need God's forgiveness, and it was hardly the last time he would do that. No wonder the, re the religious people decided Jesus just wasn't respectable enough and called him a glutton and a drunkard 
a friend of tax collectors and sinners. As Jesus was praying, following his baptism, the Spirit descends on him, and a voice says, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. I love the way the, the cotton patch gospel renders this particular account. It says, you are my dear son. I'm proud of you. Sounds like a good southern mama. <laughs> Part of the good news of the gospel is that God says to each of us, you are my dear child. Like any loving parent, God can see something in the worst of us that prompts God to say, I'm proud of you. But I think Luke is up to something more with this story. <clears throat> I wonder if what prompts God to say, I'm proud of you, isn't the two things that Luke tells us Jesus does at his baptism. The first I've already mentioned, Jesus gets in line with everybody else. And the second is something that is a regular feature in Luke's gospel, Jesus at prayer. Jesus' ministry is steeped in prayer. It is central to all that he does. Jesus surely would have appreciated the words attributed to the great reformer Martin Luther, who is supposed to have said, I have so much to do that if I don't spend at least three hours a day in prayer, I'd never get it all done. How very different from my tendency to pray if I have enough time. In fact, I wonder if we in the church look very much like Jesus at his baptism, getting in line with all of those not too respectable folks and deep at prayer. The fact that so many people think the church is a place for good, respectable people makes me wonder about the first and my own experience with prayer in the church gives me pause on the second. Now, certainly we have lovely liturgical prayers in our worship services, but get outside of worship and things are sometimes different. How many of you have ever been to a church meeting? Come on, fess up, you know. <clears throat> to a session meeting, a deacon meeting, a committee meeting, whatever. What kind of prayer did you see in those meetings? Very often what I've experienced is, is quite a bit like what pastor and author uh, Graham Standish writes about in his book, Becoming a Blessed Church. There he describes a typical church meeting where at the beginning someone prays asking God to bless what we're about to do. And then God is asked to go outside, perhaps go get a cup of coffee <laughs> while the work gets done. And then afterwards, God's invited back in and there's a prayer said asking God to bless what just transpired. Now, now perhaps that's a, a bit overstated but in those meetings you're a part of and have been a part of, how often was prayer featured as a central part of the meeting, in the middle of the meeting? How often did, did the group seek to draw on the Holy Spirit to help understand God's will or for strength in following out and living out that will? One of the, the great joys 
for me as pastor of this particular congregation is that I get to do a lot of baptisms. Something that quite a few of my colleagues rarely get to do. I love doing baptisms. But I do worry that we don't understand them very well. Some people think of, of baptism as a kind of spiritual inoculation. Others think of baptism as a nice little ritual that the grandparents will really appreciate. But Presbyterians say that in baptism, God actually does something. In baptism, God says, you're my dear child. I'm proud of you. In baptism, God joins us to Christ, making us his sisters and brothers, so that we become something different than we were before. In baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit is conferred upon us. As brothers and sisters of Christ, one of the church's biggest jobs is to help the baptized learn what it means to live out this new identity. We are called to help one another live into that new identity and incarnate Christ, make him tangible to the world. And in his baptism, in his life and ministry, Jesus shows us exactly what it looks like for dear beloved children to live and act in ways that make God proud. You are my dear child. I am proud of you, God says to Jesus and to us. And when we have truly felt the warm embrace of God's love in Christ, how can we help but long to live and act? in the ways our brother Jesus shows us. All praise and glory to the God who claims us in the waters and calls us to new life as brothers and sisters of Jesus the Christ. Thanks be to God.